I will present to you, I mean, very broadly, the book I have written in French, Organiser le monde, une autre histoire de la guerre froide, which will come out in a few weeks, maybe, because I just received a, an email from the editor. Uh, how do I, do I came, did I, did I come to this topic? You know, I'm not, a, I'm not an historian of international relation. I'm not an historian of international organization, even if I use international organization, and I'm not an historian of the Cold War. So I was not, uh, Uh, made uh, to um, publish something on the Cold War through the eyes of international organization. I, uh, it, it, it happens that I was looking at the archives of the International Labour Organization uh, because I wanted to look at the kind of convergence between Eastern and Western Europe on the question of labor. I have written before on the GDR and I wanted to look at the way they were talking to each other on this question of, uh, of labor. And then I... Um, I was looking at the archives of the, and in particular the report, the mission report of the uh, general director of the International Labor Office, uh, David Moss, who is an, an American, a US person, and I, I've seen that. Uh, it was a report that he wrote uh, when after uh, he went to uh, Poland and Czechoslovakia in January 1949, and he writes The United States and the USSR were at the root of the troubled situation today. In the United States, there was fear, it's January 1949, of the USSR, but that was a terrible misunderstanding and misconception between the East and the West. In the United States, there were two schools of thought, one of which wished a, long, a strong militaristic policy towards uh, the USSR, and there were who wished that... And to, <coughs> to which the director general belonged, uh, who felt that conciliation was desirable and possible. I was very surprised. I mean, January 1949, this guy was saying that in fact there would be no Cold War. Uh, so I really, I was so surprised that I believed, okay, so it's clear he wants to convince the people to stay, the people in Czechoslovakia and Poland to stay within the ILO, so it's a strategy just to appease the whole people, but maybe there is something more. So I de decided to follow this track. It's, you know, how historians are working. We have this kind of very, this kind of little signs, uh, traces, and we can decide to follow them or we can decide just to discard them. I decided to follow them because I thought that maybe it was interesting. I began to follow them in the ILO, uh, to follow this track in the ILO itself, and then I began to follow, uh, uh, to follow the, uh, uh, this track in other international organization archives. So I, uh, I worked in the international labor organization archives, which are, I can, I, I will, can answer a question on that, which are the best international organization archives in the UN system, and then the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, they are both in Geneva, and other archives, you know, I mean, they are just listed behind me. So I don't want to go into all these archives, but if you want, of course, I can talk about all these archives. And then what I discovered is that you can really write a completely an alternative history of the period through the eyes of international organization. And it's what I decided to do. Not because I wanted to really to do that, but because I thought it was important to do it, really. It was just a kind of mission that I gave, uh, I gave, I gave myself. The main objective of this book is not uh, to write a linear account of the Cold War, is not to write a linear history of the international organization during the Cold War. My objective was to explore the period referred as the Cold War through the lenses, through the eyes of international organization, which I see as a prism through which global balances and imbalances can be observed and are treated differently from what we hear usually about uh, the Cold War. So, and now what I will do is, first of all, just to look at the methodologies that I have used in order to look at that. Of course, it's absolutely impossible to work on all archives on, of all international organizations. So I made a very, I made a selection. How do you select? because it's a kind of, you know, I mean, the, the exercise that I have to do. You know, I mean, it's my selection. First of all, I followed what I 
found was the most important thing. It was more the social and economic issues which are dealt with within international organization. So I didn't follow all the diplomatic discussion and so on and so forth. I just left it. Le left uh, this kind of, of things, which of course is very counterintuitive because everybody would think that international organizations are just diplomatic fora. It's not what I did. I mean, other people have done that very well, so I don't have to do it again. So I followed another track. I looked at these, uh, at these archives, so which means that I concentrate myself not on uh, general assemblies, but on the secretariat of this organization. And in the secretariat of the organization, it's what, uh, what the reason why they are very useful, you find a lot of people. A lot of people which are coming, who are coming together and that you never find together in other places. Like, uh, of course, uh, civil servants, uh, experts, uh, and these experts are coming from all over the place and they are, uh, they are trained in various fields and so on and so forth and they talk to each other and they build what we call an epistemic commun community, meaning knowledge-based community. So, and on top of that, if you look Beyond the secretariat, you have also a lot of networks which are around the secretariat, and these networks are also very important. And uh, so what I discovered is that through this international organization, the Cold War is not just a period of war, but is also a period of very high level of internationalism. And this internationalism is not just an ideology, you want to be international, you want to make internationalism and so on and so forth. It's also practice. And in fact, in, in, in international organization, internationalism is practiced. And it's what make it, uh, made it uh, interesting. And the thing which I also discovered is that internationalism is not something which is uh, present despite the Cold War, but it's something which is exact, which is really a characteristic, a specificity of the Cold War. The Cold War is a period of internationalism. Not just because, of course, the three worlds of the Cold War were structured around ideas and values which were supposed to be valid for all people, but also because the UN itself the UN and all the agencies and all international organizations were really practicing this in, uh, internationalism and uh, uh, putting together a kind of international society. And um, it's what uh, I was looking at. So now I will make uh, short selections um, uh, of what I, uh, I found out, the, the, the results. First of all, I mean, these international societies which I'm looking at, which are very useful in order to understand what is the practice of internationalism, uh, are more or less networks. And I was able to identify at least two networks which were very important up to the 70s and it disappeared, which make this world of interna which make internationalism possible. One of the first uh, network, and it was very counterintuitive when I say that to people, they don't <laughs> believe me, because you have a completely different um, um, uh, definition of what it is, is an anti-fascist network. Anti-fascism was something which was, I mean, we shouldn't, we shouldn't forget that the um, uh, UN, I mean the um, United Nations, was created during the war. It was not created after the war, but it was already created during the war. And it was created as an anti-fascist organization. And a lot of people who are working in the UN in the 50s, the 60s, and up to the 70s were people who were convinced that they had to fight against fascism. And uh, they, were not, they were not all communists. There were, there were no communists in the UN. But there were really um, few communists, but not so many. I mean, not the vast majority, yeah. Uh, and, uh, but they were really convinced that, I mean, the main threat was fascism. It was not, for them, it was not communism, the main threat. The main threat was really fascism. And so, it was very interesting for me, for example, to look again at David Moss when he went, when he went to uh, Czechoslovakia and to, and to Poland. Uh, he, he is greeted by these people because he has been, uh, uh, he has enrolled in the, um, uh, in the um, 
uh, US Army to fight against fascism. Uh, David Morse himself, uh, I mean the, the director, uh, the general director of the of the um, International Labour Office, and um, he, he, in particular, he was in Mauthausen. He freed Mauthausen, the camp of Mauthausen. So when he when he went to Czechoslovakia and to Poland two times. Each time he was greeted as a liberator of Mauthausen and as an anti-fascist. And that's the reason why, I mean, people who were communists and who were, and David Morse himself who was anti-communist, I mean, he was a US person, he was really anti-communist, also he was accused of being too soft on communism uh, by, uh, by McCarthy and so on. But, you know, I mean, he, as an anti-fascist, he was accepted in the communist world, something. And, I could explain a lot of other stories which I found in, uh, in, uh, in the uh, international organization archives in which really anti-fascism continues to play a very important role to bring together people who are uh, in this international organization. The second very important um, network <laughs> is the social democratic network. And here, of course, if you look at the second and uh, inter, uh, socialist international, you, you wouldn't find them because the socialist international and before uh, and during the war and after the war, I mean, they, they were very, um, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm looking right now at their archives and, uh, and, and, and they don't know how to deal with the communist world, first of all. I mean, they're very heavily anti-communist. And also, they don't really know how to deal with international organization. So the people, the social democrats I found in international organization, who were very important in bridging, in bridging and uh, are uh, the um, a social democrat coming from the International Gruppe Demokratische Sozialisten, you know them also, uh, or what we call the, uh, the small international, they were the real internationalists among the social democrats and not the second international. Uh, and uh, these people uh, who uh, were active uh, during the war uh, in Stockholm uh, are, uh, if, you, if you look at their names, uh, Willy Brandt, Bruno Kreisky, Gunnar Myrdal and so on, and a lot of others, uh, are the ones who will be very active <coughs> during the Cold War in bridging East and West. So for me, it's absolutely not uh, uh, um, uh, um, by chance that you find them also in this group, uh, international group of democratic socialism, and then, you know, in international organization, bridging that. It's very important, this thing is very important, because you look, when you do research, I mean, of course, everybody who does, re who does research on the social democratic network, what they do is they look at the, inter uh, the socialist international. So they miss the most important thing. And they say, okay, you know, during the Cold War, the Socialist International was very anti-communist. They didn't want, you know, to talk to communists and so on and so forth, which is true. I mean, if you look at the archives, it's absolutely true. But then you have to look at other socialists, other social democrats. And here you find the International Group. And this group is much more important for this kind of bridging and so on and so forth. So that's also a way, you know, to avoid this kind of, um, of, uh, of, truth about what is the social democracy in that period and so on. So uh, beside of that, I mean, in this group, you also had so, uh, social democrats from the East. And as you might know, I mean, a lot of social democrats from the East were forced to enter the Communist Party, meaning that they were in the East, in the Eastern part of Europe, but they were former social democrat, and they still had contact to their fellow uh, uh, social democrats in the West. And that you see very clearly in international organization. I mean, they are really, they know each other. So you see people who are talking to each other, writing to each other in a very nice way, or their comrade and so on and so forth. And it's a somebody who is who's labeled as a communist with somebody who's labeled as a social democrat. But in fact, this communist is a former social democrat. So they have been together before. And that you see, they have been in the same party before, they know themselves before. And there are a lot of things that you can look, uh, that you can explain through these networks 
if you know really the biography of the people and if, if you are aware of these social democratic networks. So these are the two networks I just wanted to refer to because and one of the guy, I mean the person, I shouldn't say the guy, uh, the person who is important for that is Gunnar Myrdal, for example, who is very, is a, a Swedish social democrat uh, and who he is also obsessed by one thing, which is the last um, uh, finding, what I want to present now, is uh, the kind of imbalance between Eastern and Western Europe. And uh, uh, Gunnar Midal, um, uh, who is uh, a secret, uh, who is the secretary of the new uh, uh, the new sub organization of the UN, which is called the Economic Commission for Europe, what he wants, he wants to develop Eastern Europe. Of course, then you have the Cold War, but still, you know, he really tries to maintain the links between East and West. And uh, why? Because he really wants to improve the situation of the eastern part of Europe. Uh, he says in, uh, he, he writes in uh, 1948, it's only by fostering economic development throughout all Europe, both between east and west, and between advanced western and backward eastern country, that rapid improvement in production and living standards could be achieved. Europe is going forward, not back, and Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia particularly will and should be more industrialized than before. A new balance between East and West must come, but it will not be the old one that left the East in a semi-colonial state, which I find very important. So meaning that for him, for Myrdal, I mean, Eastern Europe was more, used to be something like a kind of semi-colony of uh, Western Europe. So in the same, in the same, in the same, um, in the same way, I mean, what I've really found out, and I think it's the most important part of my book, is that in fact, I mean, if you look at uh, the Cold War through the eyes of international organization, what they see is that the Cold War was a period structure by uh, an awareness of global social and economic inequality, exactly what uh, 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 Myrdal was saying for Europe. I mean, you can expand in a certain way for the world. And uh, more maybe than the ideological conflict between these two models of economic development and social organization between West and West, I mean, what was important in the international organization was really, I mean, fighting against this inequality because this inequality was seen as the root of, uh, of, of the war. And, uh, and so it's how you can, you know, jump from the East-West conflict to the North South conflict. Because in both cases, in both cases, I mean conflict, it's not conflict, but uh, I mean the, the imbalance. Because in both cases, what the people, what the uh, experts and what the um, officials in international organization were seeing is really this kind of inequality that you had to fight against in a certain way to maintain peace within the world. So it's another way of looking at this kind of rapprochement between Eastern European elites and Global South elites. So that's not just a kind of ideological issue, it's also a kind of development issue which is at stake here. And that's also, uh, that's also very clear when you look at the way, in particular, the development programs have been um, uh, enforced, uh, have, been have been developed, have been put in place in international organization. Eastern Europe is always, I mean, is very often used as a kind of blueprint for development programs that you can export in, uh, in, um, uh, to uh, the global, uh, to, to the, what, what's called at that time, uh, the third world. Okay, it's what, uh, maybe I just finish here. Thank you very much, Sandrine, for the introduction of your book. It really wants uh, us to, uh, or makes us want to, to read it as soon as possible, while some <laughs> of us might 
wait a few more weeks to read the English <laughs> translation, we'll yeah. now hear a comment from Katja Kastrick Naumann, who has read the French original, um, okay. and will uh, have a few comments and, and questions for Sandrine. Yeah. Katja is a historian of Eastern and Central Europe, which she's, she studies from a transregional perspective. Uh, she has received her PhD for a dissertation on the formation of world history teaching and research in the United States. Um, and is now a tenured researcher at the Leibniz Institute for the History and Culture of East and Central Europe and lecturer at Leipzig University. Um, Katja works on the history of international organizations as well and on the history of internationalism, the history of area studies and the history and theory of world and global history. She has published widely on these topics as well as on the history of Eastern Europe in a global and transnational perspective. And currently, Katja is writing a monograph on the politics um, of Polish experts um, in the secretariats of the uh, League of Nations and the United Nations, and the impact of these experts on international health, trade, yeah. and the social sciences. But now we'll hear a comment by Katja on uh, Sandrine's book. Thanks a lot. It's almost intimidating. Um, <laughs> so, uh, a comment shall raise questions that came while reading, and I will do so. And I have three three questions. But I nevertheless, nevertheless would like to start by saying that I really read Sandrine's code not only with get, um, great interest, um, which you can judge from my own research interest, but also with a lot of pleasure. And there are three th merits that stand out for me. The first is, it is clearly an academic work, but it offers a compelling and an exciting reading. It reminded me actually of a good criminal story. With every page we turn, uh, we see new sides of a complex constellation <coughs> in which an engaged group of actors, unionists, experts, international officials, activists, try to reduce economic and social inequalities and to regulate asymmetric global power relations. We read about the obstacles they encounter, where they failed, and what they achieved, and that is illuminating. Yet I also enjoyed the style of writing. Sandrine moves skillfully between explaining uh, general lines of development, that is providing information for readers who are neither familiar with IOs nor with the Cold War, while she also brings in a lot of archival material that sheds light on concrete, specific actors' agendas and their trajectories in international politics between the late 1940s and late 1980s. And above all, I found her perspective refreshing. Most histories of international organizations center on the big powers, leave out the many societies and states that constitute the international sphere. And this book is different. We move to different parts of Europe and other regions of the world to better understand the politics that were decided in international New York, Geneva, and Vienna. Good books answer questions, but they also open new ones. And um, I found in particular three arguments of the book thought-provoking, two concern new avenues of research, and one is related to the English edition that you mentioned. So first, at the heart of the book um, is the argument that we should not understand the period between World War II and 1989, mainly through the lenses, narratives, and logics of the Cold War, understood as a geopo uh, geopolitical constellation, but rather see the decades as a time of heightened awareness of social injustice and economic inequality. Yet at the same time, Sandrine, you wrote your book also with a vocabulary that emerged precisely in the political divides and confrontations. First, second, third world, blocks, east, west, south, um, as well as categories of political hierarchies, mid-sized powers, small states. Of course, we all use these terms, and contemporaries also did use them. And yet I ask myself, have you found in the many sources that you looked at also other repertoires of contemporary language that reflects more the social and economic concerns of your actors? Or to put it otherwise, if development was at the heart of the Cold War, maybe we would need in the future to return to some of the categories and concepts which were used precisely to address social economic struggles. My second point, um, 
You make this interesting generational argument that most of the actors um, in the UN um, knew each other from the 1920s and 30s social democratic networks as well as the anti-fascist movement. And that is precisely these connections that help to bridge the political divides. And I do think that this observation really helps us to see the shift towards the neoliberal paradigm in international organizations in the 1980s and the following, not as a defeat of earlier positions, but indeed as a change of, change of generations. And that helps us, that moves uh, research literature forward. But yet, if we would look at the opposing side, at the neoliberals, with a similar biographical perspective and a similar long-term perspective, would we not also see a longer history of their ascent? That is to say, many of those neoliberals in the 80s also have roots, partly generational, that go back to the 1930s, if you just think of Hayek, the liberal internationalism, uh, international, etc. And if we take that into consideration, we probably can in the future ask more precisely what exactly, in addition to this generational change, made them successful in the 1980s. And maybe we can then also explore a little bit better what their contenders did in the 1990s and following, which is usually a story of demise, but maybe with your perspective, we can see um, new things again. And my last point, last but not least, concerns the English translation that is coming out soon and which I must say I had the pleasure to read. Um, and um, the, the point concerns the fact that I guess most of us have made the experience that translating a text written in the own mother tongue or native language into English um, goes along with difficulties, right? The way of reasoning, arguments, notions, um, sometimes things get lost. Um, and I'd just be interested in your experience. What, is, what has changed from the French to the English version? Uh, what do we find in the one book which we don't find in the other? Thank you very much, Katja. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think we'll now hear a, a second comment by Antje Dietz uh, and then uh, Sandra. I answer have, after, okay. okay. Then you'll have the opportunity yeah. to, okay. to respond uh, to, to both of the, mm. of the comments. So it's my pleasure now to introduce, maybe if it's, if it's even necessary here in Leipzig, but for those of you who, who um, don't know Antje Dietz, it's my pleasure to introduce her now. Uh, she's a postdoctoral researcher at the Collaborative Research Center processes of spatialization under the global condition uh, and uh, at the Leipzig Research Center Global Dynamics, as well as deputy director and coordinator of the Leipzig Center for the Study of France and the Francophonie. So several uh, connections and qualifications for, for our debate here. Uh, Antje has received her PhD for a dissertation on the role of cultural institutions and artistic practices in the social transformations after 1989. And her research interests include transnational history and the social and cultural history of Germany, Europe, and North America in the 19th and 20th centuries. And currently, Antje is working on a habilitation on the entrepreneurs and transnational connections of the entertainment industries in North America and Europe between the 1880s and the 1920s. And from a range of publications, I'd like to point out only her most recent uh, book, an edited volume on urban popular culture and entertainment experiences from northern East, Central, and Southern Europe, 1870s to 1930s. Antje, we're looking forward to your comment and questions. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, I think I will mirror some of uh, Katja's impressions, but maybe formulate them differently, also because, as she said, she read the English version, I read the French version, so I will maybe comment on a different book. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> you, you decide, uh, uh, according to our comments. I also like to start with... Uh, uh, some things that made me really interested in this book and uh, also uh, why it is a pleasure for me to promote it here. I'm very interested also in this question of East-West entanglements, interactions, and how to, how to research them um, in a way that on the one hand shows these relations and um, how they transformed East and West, but also in a way that still takes seriously 
these divisions that are there. Um, of, we know it's an ideological discourse that we need to de deconstruct, but still there were divisions. And, and so to strike this balance is, I know from experience and others too as well, is not easy. And this book is a very good uh, example for how to tread this fine line and how to find methodological tools of how, how to do this. And we've talked already about the kind of actors uh, that come into play here that can give us these insights, especially behind the curtains, behind the theater of big conferences and, and, uh, and councils. <coughs> And also spaces like uh, cities like Vienna, mm -hmm. that bridge east and west, small countries, neutral countries, actors from there. So all this comes into play uh, to tell stories in a different way. And I found that very inspiring. Um, and out of this plurality of actors, networks, and groups, um, we get to a plurality of internationalisms also, and that is very important because yeah, with this idea of the Cold War on the blocks, um, uh, it is really important to uncover this plurality of, uh, of different projects. And um, of course there are like different stories in your book. There are the big internationalisms, the Western one, the Eastern one, and then the Southern one. Um, and there's a certain trajectory of how they emerge one after another and how they then also this constellation uh, declines at the end of the 20th century. And um, there's also kind of in the end, um, well, this with the end of the Cold War, also the decline of the socialist world. We know this story, but um, um, we also have all these small internationalisms that are beyond, behind, um, and crossing these, uh, these, these bigger ones, and I find them especially <clears throat> interesting. And um, this relates a bit, I would say, these many uh, internationalisms to something that we study here as well at the Research Center Global Dynamics and especially at the Sonderforschungsbereich, which we call globalization projects, mm -hmm. but <laughs> in a different sense of globalization than you use it, I'm sure. But um, like really this idea of actor-centered uh, projects of people who want to organize the world in a, in a certain way and pursue an agenda. And if we really take seriously what they're about, then maybe this doesn't align with the blocks or certain preconceived notions that we have now. And this is really how you can shift narratives. And I found this, uh, this very impressive uh, also when you find then the issues that they talk about. And and so um, we have a shift in the spatial understanding of the Cold War in a certain sense of going beyond this uh, spatial division. But I think, and you say this in your introduction, uh, that your book is not a linear history of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. um, and that comes also out of all these small internationalisms because they're attached to other histories. Um, so we have the story of neoliberalism in the book. We have the story of these generations of social democrats in the book. We have the pre and the history, the prehistory and the after history of the new international economic order, for example. We have the history of cybernetics and planning uh, that also is very interesting now again. So you also shift this, the temporalities of the Cold War, I would say. And you can find other continuities going back to the interwar years or even to the 19th century and to issues that we have now that also escapes this block logic with a clear beginning and end. And I find this very productive because there we have a lot of new research questions that open. And one of them I was thinking about, besides the examples that I just named, is the question of regional organizations mm -hmm. that we also touch upon. We have a lot of colleagues here at the center who work in new regionalisms, so research fields in political <coughs> studies and regional studies that says that basically after 89, um, we have a new situation of a world of regionalisms, uh, so a, a kind of a different idea of multilateralism that you say has been weakened after. You know? And so we have um, different organizations, not just the e EU or the African Union or ASEAN or Mercosur and smaller ones as well. And I wonder what you think about this, like, because this is a story of, you know, the question is also big, not just of equality, but also of multilateralism mm -hmm. and what has become of it and has it declined or not. And if we start with this, this new situation with the many regional organizations, it also play a role in your story. How, 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 how would the story look if we follow that thread? And another little question that I had is, I read your book not just as 
a history um, of the international organizations and issues, uh, questions of development and equality during the Cold War, but also as a history of the left, in a way. Mm -hmm. A certain milieu of the left, certain experts um, that try to organize the way in a, in a certain way. And we've heard already about a certain generation, mm -hmm. a pre um, interwar generation that then really gets to structure things after the war and then um, leaves the stage. And then I was, um, I was thinking about what is with the new left? Mm -hmm. you, you, you talk about this a lot in the mm -hmm. book. So you say there's a changed uh, situation from the 70s on. We have the new social movements. Mm -hmm. We have the fragmentation of the communist international. We have these reformist socialists who get more interested in Western management practices. We have the neoliberal paradigm coming. But I was thinking all the time, has the classical new left forgot to march into the institutions of international organizations? What happened there? Why are they not more present in these secretariats? Yeah, because they're, they're present in the context, but why are they not at the table as much as I would have expected them to be, maybe. So that is uh, another question from my side. And uh, to not speak too long, we can come back to some things. Um, in the discussion, I would also underline what Katja has already said. This is a book that I think is interesting, not only for people interested in the Cold War, um, but also to understand the paradigm shifts that we're living now in this neoliberal world and why it is so different from the second half of the 20th century. So if you're interested in that, you will find many answers in this book. And also because I know that there are many people in the room that are writing books or are mm -hmm. writing their first book. So if you want a good example of how to bring to the fore a new perspective and do it with clarity and with a great argumentative structure, you can learn a lot also from the writing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antje, for your common questions. And now, Sandrine, if you would like to yeah. respond. I mean, first of all, I'm really honored by your comments. Thank you very much, both of you, Katja and uh, Antje. And first of all, because it's very nice to be, to have been read so carefully and so generously. And, you know, I mean, a lot of reading are not generous. I mean, people want to find something in your book, and if they don't find it, that's the end of it. So I like when people are really reading, you know, by following what you want to do and you followed exactly what I wanted to do. And it was very nice just to hear it in your, uh, um, and, and what you've said. So thank you very, very much for that. So um, a lot of very interesting questions. Um, in fact, I begin maybe, uh, maybe I won't answer all of them, but I want, I want to answer at least uh, three or four of them. The so first one is uh, this question of generation. I mean, we, we talked about that already, so we, we, we know. Uh, and um, and it's, it's, it's really nice, again, that you, you mentioned that, because it's very important for me. You know, I mean, you have this generation of people, anti-fascist, uh, social democrats, and so on and so forth. And of course, I mean, they are there before what we call the Cold War. They are there already in, in the interwar period. And then, you know, they, they, you, you find them in the UNRWA International, um, uh, um, I mean, this organization which bridges, in fact, the League of Nations uh, to the UN during the war and uh, between 1943 and 1947. And you have all these people. They are in UNRWA and then they go to the UN system. So uh, these people, um, this generation comes to the end, to, a, to an end in the 70s. And you're right, that's one of the explanations for the neoliberal turn. But it's not, of course, it's not the, 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 uh, the only explanation. The other explanation is very simple. In fact, I guess I can show you that's a new international liberal order, uh, economic order. Mm. Uh, so uh, here it is. Uh, uh, just let me show you. So in, uh, um, in May 1974, as you know, the United Nations General Assembly adopted the declaration of a new international economic order, <coughs> which is pushed by the third world countries or the non-aligned movement and what, uh, organized in 
what has been called the J77. And here you see, I, I like this picture. It has been given to me uh, by, uh, I can, oh no, okay, no. Uh, given to me uh, by the archivist uh, of the League of Nations, not given, but just sent it to me. Because this is the first, uh, the first um, uh, meeting of the J77, meaning you know, the third world countries. And it's in the library of the UN, where we go to the archives now. <laughs> so this room is, is a beautiful room. And I can imagine, you can feel, if you look very closely to the picture, you can feel you know, how these people are proud. They are proud of being in these United Nations. You know, it's a recognition for them. You know, the United Nations, for them, it was very important to be part of it. It was very important to be recognized as a fully-fledged country and as a fully-fledged representative, exactly like other uh, representatives of the country. So the third world coming into the international organization, it's huge. It's, it's, it's not something, it's not something, you know, beside, no, it's absolutely central. And I think that, uh, in particular, you know, they, they're coming into this international in the 50s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and they're changing the rules. They're really changing the rules in the General Assembly. And also, I mean, I see it for the ILO in particular, I know the ILO better. Also in the ILO, I mean, in a lot of, um, of committees and so on and so forth. So, and then, you know, at the end, you have this declaration of 1977. It was really too much. And then what you have to look at is the reaction to this declaration. Of course, in the General Assembly, you know, it has been voted in favor. You know, nobody is uh, just uh, social democrats are really trying the Brandt report and so on and so forth just to try to accompany this declaration in a certain way. But what you see, if you look at other organizations, um, other places, in particular the employer places. The inter, uh, and, and right now I'm looking because it has been declassified for me, I asked I ask for declassification. I'm working at the um, organization uh, of the International Organization of Employers within the ILO. I'm, uh, we, I've looked with other colleagues at the uh, International uh, Chamber of Commerce. I've looked at the UNIS, the Inter <coughs> Union of, um, of International of Employers Confederation of Europe, at the BIAC, uh, close to the OECD. We have the archives. And the UNIAPAC, not directly because the archives are not accessible, but you can access the archives of the, uh, you can access some of the UNIAPAC uh, reaction through uh, the, Council, the World Council of Churches, because the right to the World Council of Churches. And then you see an immense mobilization, an immense mobilization against the new international economic order. I mean, they're not so afraid of socialism because they know that it's the end. They already know. No, they already know that they won't achieve what they want. But they are absolutely scared by the new international economic order and by the third world, the demands of the third world. And I think that's exactly what matters in the second half of the 70s. And then, you, of course, you have the usual suspect. You have the US and UK governments in the 80s and so on. But in, but in particular, you have a real mobilization. And it was, I mean, I, can, I could give you a lot of examples. For example, I was so surprised in the World um, Council of Churches you know, I didn't know that in the World Council of Churches were also very much in favor of the theology of liberation and all these things because I didn't know there was such a theology of liberation among Protestants. I thought it was more Catholic things. So I just discovered that, you know, my, just my ignorance. And then I looked at the archives. And so they, they are, they're setting up a committee, you know, for in favor of the theology of liberation. And after two years, they received letters from the UNIAPAC I mean, just for the Christian employers, say, telling them, stop it. Now you have to stop that. And then, I mean, you look at the people who are inside the World Council of Churches who are stopping the whole thing. They are all coming, they are Swiss uh, uh, Protestants, Swiss pastors, all, if you look at the, you know, uh, it's very well done because in Lausanne, I mean, they have this uh, database on uh, the Swiss elites, so you can look at these people, the Swiss elites, they are all coming from Nestle. All. 
I mean, they are all more or less, you know, close to Nestle and so on and so forth. So it's not that it's not that it comes from itself, you know. It's not just the, the end of a generation. There is also mobilization very clearly in favor. I mean, to block the new international economic order and to favor other people. So it's not the only story. There are certainly other ways of looking at it, but it's what you look, what you see when you look at international organization, in particular if you look at the UN Committee for Transnational Cooperation and so on, the archives, and then you see how everything is blocked and by whom it has been blocked and so on and so forth. So, you know, it's uh, it, there is a, there is certainly a, a mobilization. So and that goes in the same direction to your question, um, Auntie, on uh, where 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 did the new left went, go in a certain way. And you're right. I also ask myself this question. Where did they go? Why are they absent from international organization? And you know why? I think that they are not absent from international organization. They go in this kind of third worldism. You have them. Uh, you have the Sussex School of uh, Sussex School of uh, of, um, of Development and so on and so forth. These people who are kind of uh, not real Marxists but close to Marxism and so forth. These people again, they are attacked at the end of the 70s and they just disappear. They just they just went away because they were not uh, employed directly by international organizations, but most of the time they were experts. So they're not re-employed as experts. They just disappear. And uh, so, it's, uh, so it's not that the new left was not there, but it just it was there for a very short period of time, you know, on this kind of development issues and so on. And you see them very clearly, if you look in particular at the program, at the, at the report of the World Employment Program of the ILO, which is a very important program to look at them. These, they, are, they are there in the World Employment Program. And then, just at the end. Uh, so, uh, okay, uh, translate, no, vocabulary. You're right, and we also had this discussion before. Um, if, we, if you look at the whole thing through an other angle, which is not the angle of the, of the block politics and so on and so forth, what you have is developed, underdeveloped. That's, and, and it's how they think very often about the countries. Like, I mean, you look at Myrdal, I mean, the, this quotation doesn't say communist and, and, and capitalist. It says developed and, uh, and, and backward. He said backward in 1948, meaning East is backward, developed is, uh, is the West. And then you find it again, for example, for Romania and Bulgaria, and that they can, in a certain way, bridge the West and the global south because they are less developed, so they know better about how to develop. So all these things you have to find. So that's really their framework, which doesn't mean that the blocks, and you're right, I mean, Antia, I mean, it's not that it is not there. It is there, and it is also there in the discussion. It is also there in the organization of how you talk in international organization, who is, I mean, and it, they still, talk as blocks, and, uh, and it's very important The G77 exists as a block, and it's very important to have this block within the UN. And uh, so it's not that it's either one, either this one or the other, they are together. And so you cannot ignore that they are there. So that's why I'm, I have to use this vocabulary, because it's also the vocabulary of the period. I mean, it's, it's not that it doesn't exist at all. Uh, with general organization, uh, well, that's really a, a big topic. I, I, I will leave it. Uh, 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 translation. Uh, uh, translation, it was very, uh, I mean, I, I was lucky because I have a beautiful translator. My translator was so good because I made, I, I'm, I could have translated Maybe I could have, with the help of Deep L, I could have translated it myself, uh, but, uh, but uh, I didn't do that. Uh, and I paid for a translation, and I, 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 I found a very good one. So it was really somebody with whom I could really discuss, and he understood very well what I was doing, what I wanted to do. And on top of that, I have to say, I changed also a lot of my book. For the, uh, for the English readership, for the U I mean, it will be published in the US. Because um, there are things that, to make it more accessible 
to them and to an international audience, I had to rewrite stuff, you know. I mean, it's important. It's what I've done, for example, for my book, um, for my German, for my book in German on the German social state. It is also an entirely rewritten book from the French version, but it's really, it's really a new book. In that case, it just, I changed a lot. Not everything. It's the same structure, it's the same, but I changed because, um, yeah, just to address the people there. Yeah, so and a diplomatic way of framing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, so, and I think, yeah, it's always like that. I mean, if you really want to have a good translation and, and to, to, talk to, to talk to the people, you know, I mean, it was good to have this book in, in, in French. Uh, at the beginning, I thought I would write it directly in English. But I was very happy to have it in French because then, you know, there was a French, dis there was a French discussion around the book. And of course, you know, the French discussion is not uh, international discussion or the kind of US discussion that I will have. Uh, because, uh, as you know, I mean, the political scene is fr in France is very different. Uh, and they know about communism much better than, uh, than in the US. Uh, they don't know or they fear or whatever. I mean, they have this kind of representation. So it was very good to have, uh, to have the French version, but it was also very good to, uh, it's, I'm 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 re really looking forward to the reception in uh, in the US. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandrine. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, insights also into the the process of writing such a book because I think that now that we're here at the research center on global dynamics, we're not only working on global dynamics but there are also global and international dynamics in our work, as we can mm. as we can see there that that. Uh, you don't just translate a book, you have to think of the audience that, you, mm. that you're writing for, which is, um, even if it's in English, of course, it's not, not the same globally. <coughs> there, are, there are very specific scholarly traditions and expectations, what a book is supposed to do, what it's mm. supposed to look like. Mm. Probably won't be white in the, in the, in the English edition. Uh, yeah, yeah no, that's, it was interesting, for example, for the introduction. They, they made me rewrite my introduction because I had to have the, the, first, uh, you know, the, the first page with the main argument. And of course, in French, you have the main argument at the end of the introduction because you have to, you know, you have to, to bring your reader into the end and to be, you know, to, to, to make him think about what you can do and so on. No, of course, in, in the US you have to make one big point from the beginning. That's important. So they asked me to do that and of course I did it because I wanted to be published. Yeah. I was looking for the table of contents and yeah, I was looking in the front and like, <laughs> yeah. oh yes, it's a French book. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. at the end. So yeah, yeah, of course, in French book. And with a lot of, like in the German book, I mean, with a lot of undertitle sub, and so, subtitles yeah, and so on. And of course, in the, in the English version, I just have the, um, the chapters, yeah. No subchapters, no subtitles, which are so important well, to follow the argumentation. Okay, so. A lot of... Bad. Dynamics in the, in the global uh, book market and, and uh, historical research. Thank you again very much for for that um, uh, for the introduction of your book and for for your comments and questions. I think we're now able to open up uh, the floor for questions and comments from from the audience, um, both on the content of the book, of course, but also if you're interested more in the process of writing, publishing. I think that will also be questions that, of course, uh, we could talk about. Uh, very good question. Uh, shall I answer the question yeah. right after the answer? Okay, very good question. Um, uh, the international organization archives, you know, I mean, you have to navigate uh, these archives. Uh, as I said, I mean, the best one is the ILO. Uh, why? Because you have the, um, uh, the P files, the personal files of the people. I mean, for the uh, officials, for the official working in the organization, you have access for only for the ILO. The other organizations don't give you access to the P5. The League of Nations, they give you access, but not the, I mean, the, the UNESCO, they won't, the UN, they won't, and so on. But for the ILO, after a certain period of time, you have access to the P5. So, and it's very, 
CSP files are just amazing because you get the letter of introduction of the person who will be recruited if, he, if this person uh, gets recruited. Of course, if he doesn't get recruited, you don't have the P file. But, and then you see the network. And I've seen that in particular in the ILO. The people who have been the kind of reference letters that they get and from where they get their reference letter. And that, and it's very clear in the Alberto um, uh, time, of course, in the 20s, the 30s. So socialist, I mean, socialist, I mean, social democrats. And you see in particular for Vienna, for the Germans and so on and so forth, not all Germans, but in particular for the Austrian and for some Germans, you see the, the letters written by social democrats. By their, you know, I mean, they are recommending this guy who is so important and so on and so forth. So, and you see that in the P file. Of course, you don't have P files for everybody, but there is a second group of people with, uh, which is even more important for me, these are the experts. The experts, what they call, they have ex call contract. I mean, the contract which is a kind of external contract for these collaborators. That's why it's called ex call uh, for these experts. And then, of course, this recruitment of experts is also documented in the, in, the, in, 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 the, in, in the archives. And you can look at the recruitment of these experts and how they are. And then, for example, for the CSEC school I was, uh, I was mentioning, it's, it's very clear. Uh, uh, it's very difficult, in fact, for an international organization to recruit experts, to recruit good experts. It's really a challenge. And so they have to have a kind of connection to certain institutions. And they select their institution, and then you know, they, get their, they get their expert from the same institution. It's how they went through the, uh, for example, a Sussex School, which is the first uh, big uh, development um, uh, department in the, in the, in the, in the UK, uh, in the University of Sussex, which is yeah, more third, uh, I mean, the kind of uh, a new left uh, influence and so on and so forth. And, they find this way of recruiting experts, and then they continue recruiting these experts through this kind of institution. And I have found, for example, why do you have so many uh, British experts? Because in British universities, in particular Oxford and Cambridge, they set up very early on a kind of specialized agencies to work together with international organization and to promote their own experts to international organization. So that's also the reason why in management, for example, because I worked on management, I found so many British experts. And of course, I mean, the Brit are not so well known for being so good management specialists at that time, but they were able just to sell their people as are always doing. They sell the people very well in international organizations. So, you know, you can find traces of that. Yeah. Oh, wow, it's a complicated question. Thank you. Uh, um, it's. Um, uh, how can I answer this question? Um, you know, there are always two ways of looking at these kind of concepts and how they change. I mean, you can just follow your actors and how the actors are talking, and you can just, and, and, or you can uh, try to elaborate a kind of analytical categories and look if this analytical category is still working uh, when you change over time. And um, what, I, what I did for this particular book is really to follow the actors. Because, uh, because I had a lot of them, because they discuss with each other, and because they have to find a kind of common language. And in international organization, that's very important, the language. The language is absolutely crucial because people are coming from various, uh, from various backgrounds, and they have to elaborate a language a common language together. So it's not that they use randomly any word. The words that they're using to talk to each other is something that they have discussed. That's why it's important to you to stick to their, 
to the way they're defining their own categories because these categories have been thought over. It's not that it's not random at all. And if you know, I mean, if you talk to people uh, who are still working in international, it's, it's a big issue. It's, it's a main issue of international organization, finding the right category and the right, right word to address an issue. And, uh, and that's what I, what I did. And uh, I don't know about communism because it's not a word which is used in international organization, by the way. <laughs> they, don't, they never talk about communism. Um, uh, only the people who, who claim being communist, eventually they say they are communist, but uh, not the expert and so on. Uh, they don't even talk so much about being socialist or being whatever. So, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not a real category for them. I mean, the category is more... Uh, yeah, development, uh, backward, developed. Uh, uh, what what would they say? I mean, and and also geographical. You know, as they define region and subregion, that goes uh, in your direction, uh, in particular, and 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 they redraw re the subregion, for example, <coughs> that Eastern Europe. I mean, South Eastern Europe goes to the Middle East. It's it goes together. It goes together because of a lot of reasons that I could, uh, I, I could explain. So, I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's how they, they, they build their categories more than, uh, um, than other things. Okay. Okay, many, many questions. <laughs> okay, yeah, my book is structured um, uh, chronologically. It's, uh, it's, chrono it's chronological plus topical. It's what we call in French uh, un plan chronologico-thématique. Uh, so for each period, I have a certain topics that I, I address and, and then so. There is a chronology of the book, obviously, and uh, I, I don't want to go through the, the, the whole thing. And of course, I didn't, I didn't have the chance to go to the 70s, but the 70s is a chapter in itself. I mean, this kind of uh, what we call the neoliberal turn. And I explained that for me, it's also connected to the kind of uh, disempowerment of the third world within international organization. So where did they, where did they go? They, they didn't leave, but they just disappeared as a group. They were, uh, you know, after, uh, in, in the second half of the 70s, you have the, um, uh, uh, the oil countries, which get richer and richer, and the others uh, who were supposed, in fact, also to gain from the, um, uh, from the oil prices and get poorer and poorer. And then uh, it has been also studied, not by me, uh, that in particular, I mean, the US government really introduces and uses this shift between the countries just to make uh, the kind of, uh, just to disentangle this kind of, uh, of group as a group. And also, plus you have the debt crisis in the 80s, uh, 1980s, um, uh, that is very no well-known story, so I don't want to, uh, to explain that. But the third world as a group, you know, which is just in a certain way entering the international organization as a kind of full-fledged participant, just disappear as a group, as an important group within this uh, international organization. On the, on, on, on the other side, you have a regional organization like the, um, 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 the European Union, which gains a lot of preeminence in international organization at that time. So, I mean, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's yeah, it's, it's a change of, in the balance of power very clearly. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, the socialist bloc, if you can tell that, which is just... Uh, the beginning of the end. I mean, you see that in international organizations, like for example, I, I remember having read, in particular in the Stasi archives, um, 
uh, uh, recording because they, they they didn't even have the time just to 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 to, to put it down. So it was uh, it was I, I was I was sitting there with my um, my headphone and I was just listening to the to the Stasi guy saying that's the end of it. Uh, it, it was in the beginning of the 80s already. He says at the end of it, you know, they are uh, um, arguing with uh, human rights, and uh, and we have a, we have an issue with human rights because we can. He said he said basically, we should just use use human rights. We we should also use the same discourse. We should use the same words, and we should go within it, and so on and so forth. So they are in a certain way trapped in the discourse which is provided by the West, and they have to adjust to this discourse and they don't know how to do it. So they are lost, you know. They're, and they are not even able in this, in, in this period, in the 80s, to argue with social and economic rights anymore. Because they've done that before. Before, you know, with the help of the third world countries, they were always saying, yeah, okay, but your human rights, it's okay, forced labor, okay, but what, what, about, what about unemployment? Unemployment also leads to forced labor. At that time, in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, beginning of the 70s, they were still doing that. The second half of the 70s, it's just vanishing, the 80s at the end. And that's something which is really impressive, and they know that. They know that they are not able to make their point anymore. Which, in a way, it's very strange. Because you have unemployment in the 80s. And, but, you know, it's, it's at the end. It's not appealing anymore. I mean, this, they cannot. And that's something which is very striking when you look at the archives of international organizations. Something that you, it's not as clear Usually, when you look, you know, at kind of international relation things and so on and so forth. If you look at, the, for example, the CIA archives, a lot of them are, are online now. The CIA knew that they couldn't compete anymore. For example, I mean, there are a lot of reports on the Soviet Union, which was not uh, in which it was not even uh, uh, possible to get uh, phone calls and so on and so forth. So they knew. So in fact, they knew that the enemy, in a certain way, was very weak at that uh, at that time. So there was no real discussion. And you know, the East. I mean, the communist representatives in international organization, whatever you can, you may think about uh, the reality of the real existing socialism. I mean, they are the ones who are the more, in the 60s and the 70s, the more pertinent on uh, the balance of power in the, in, 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 in the world. It's just unbelievable. About, for example, multinational corporations, they voted at the end, they voted for, the, for example, the tripartite declaration and so on and so forth. But the analysis that they do, all of in particular in the ILO, they, 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 they do on multinational corporations, of course it's not, they are multinational corporation. Also, I mean, they were accused also to have internet multinational corporation. It's just unbelievable. It's, it's so true. As a critic of real existing capitalism, they're very good. As a kind of promoter of real existing socialism, they're very bad. <laughs> Thank you. Matthias Lidl. I didn't put words in plural in the uh, title, but it's exactly what you described. It's uh, in a way, and it's a complicated story because, you know, at the end of the Second World War, uh, already in the interwar period, you have liberal internationalism, and it's predominant, of course. And you have this kind of, yeah, you have other internationalisms. Uh, you have of course, a communist internationalism, which is, which is weak in a certain way, but which looks very strong and powerful to the anti-communist world. It's also, uh, and by the way, it's also one part of one chapter about anti-communism because it's important for my story. So, 
And of course, you have also the fascist internationalism, which is also important, and so I worked on that, I mean, uh, for, for, for Nazism and so on. So, and, and, and the Christian internationalism and so on. So there are many, many, many internationalism, which doesn't mean that there are many worlds in a certain way. So all this internationalism, and the thing which is for me, when I began working on the ILO archives, I couldn't really understand why the Soviet Union joined the ILO. Because the ILO, the International Labour Organization, was made <coughs> explicitly against the Soviet Union, against the Bolshevik Revolution. So how, how does it come that the Soviet at the end, you know, in 1934 already, and then again in 1958, I mean, how do they, uh, in 1945, how do they join the ILO? Why do they do that? That's, that's a mystery in a certain way. It's already, you know, a sign of their weakness. In a, yeah. Uh, because they are not able really to create an alternative internationalism which is competing with the, inter with the liberal internationalism. They have to enter the liberal international organization which are there. And it's what they do, which doesn't mean that they are completely uh, 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 without any power, powerless inside this organization. It's what they try to do, for example. It's very clear. Why do Czechos and, they, and, and you know, they leave for a certain period of time. During Stalinism, uh, almost all uh, socialist, I mean real um, or state socialist countries leave international organization. The Czechoslovaks and the Poles don't leave the international labor organization. So it's interesting to look at the archives to know why they stay. And luckily, I have, uh, a, I have a former graduate student who is Czech and who was able just to look at the archives, just to look. And why do they stay? They don't stay because they really believe in the international organization. They stay because the people who are in charge of the international labor organization within the Czechoslovak uh, government are former social democrats. This is the same network, and they fight to stay inside the international labor organization, uh, Erban and other. I mean, I, I, I know their names. And so it's not, so you see, it's a very complicated story. It's not a kind of, and again, you know, I mean, you, you, you hear very often Czechoslovakia, Poland, and so on. So these countries are also much more plastic, much more diverse than one we, when, when, when we say. You have different, you have various groups. So that's the reason why, for example, uh, I mean, um, the Czech and the, and the Poles uh, stayed um, in, in, the, in the ILO because they were there before, because they had connections and so on, and so they stay the same people, exactly the same people as the people uh, uh, from the interwar years who had become communists, but who were social democrats, stay and really fight to stay inside the organization. So, but the point is, you know, it's very interesting to look at the way, because we were thinking about one word, many words, and so on and so forth. It's very interesting to look at the way these communists adapt to the culture of the liberal culture of international organization. First of all, they are praised. At the beginning, you know, everybody fear. Everybody fear them. Oh, okay, how can you talk with these people and so on and so forth. And then, you know, when you look at, uh, and, at uh, um, uh, the evaluation of these, uh, they are very well praised, in particular the ones who are really very good uh, in, uh, internationalists in a certain way are the Yugoslavs. They, are very, they send a lot of very good people, very well trained, and so on and so forth. But the same, you know, for the Poles, the Czechs, and so on and so forth. They send very, very good people. That's not the case for all countries. Some countries send, you know, their worst people to international organization. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can tell some. I went one, one, one country, but uh, uh, but. Uh, but some, some countries send really their, their best people, and they send their best people. So that's, for me, it has always been in question, and it's an unsolved question. It's just a sign of weakness that, in fact, I mean, they didn't pursue the goal of really building an alternative world, a real alternative world, that they didn't do. 
And even inside the international organization, what they did is just to adapt to the organization. It's, and it's even, it's even more obvious for the third world. I mean, the third world, what they wanted, you know, they really completely endorsed the, the, uh, the language of development, technical development, and so on. They didn't, they didn't really, I mean, the people in, I'm not talking about everybody in the third world, of course. I'm only talking of the people who are, we see we're inside the international organization who are the elites of these countries. Huh? So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about everybody in the, uh, in the third world. But these people, I mean, they are just completely endorsing the language of uh, development and so on and so forth. They don't question that at all. So in fact, there is already a very powerful language, which is, uh, I don't know if you agree with me, um, uh, uh, Katya, but for me, it has always been a kind of um, very, yeah, um, in particular for the communists, I, I couldn't believe that they entered this organization. I think you're right with the description that um, mm. there are no alternative internationalisms in the yeah. sense that they operate outside of these organizations. Yeah. And there is this very, very good book by Ilya Gaiduk mm. called yeah. uh, Divided, Divided Together, together. <clears throat> yeah. 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 who mm. studies the interrelation between the yeah. Russians and the Americans yeah. uh, until um, the, until Uh, the early 70s. Yeah. And what he really reconstructs from the sources, mm -hmm. not only from the UN sources, but also yeah. from the foreign ministries yeah. of both countries, he shows how after a period of complete confrontation where the Russians mm. also yeah. withdraw mm. from any kind of collaboration, yeah. how they grow together, how they yeah, become they really in, in the... Mm in the argumentation, in the tactics, mm. in the strategies, mm. that they increasingly resemble alike, mm. uh, resemble each other. Mm. And he explains it with the fact, and I think this is what we see from other organizations as well, that the, the, this being together in this international mm. sphere does something with the people yeah. who act there. Yeah. Um, and also and because they share, a lot of, they share a lot of beliefs. I mean, they share the belief in development, they share the belief in progress, they share, you know, there are a lot of things that they share. They, they, when they work together uh, in, uh, in, in other organizations like um, YASA or others, you know, I mean, they're, they're sh you know, they share a lot of beliefs. If you go into what is called technical, but the technical is very political, I would say, in international organization. I mean, then, I mean, they can work together without any issue. It would be much more complicated for people who really are, don't believe in progress, for example, or don't believe in, a, uh, like, now, for example, you know. But they don't question that. I have one question myself now that yeah. ties into this. What do we do with the Cold War? So what, what do we mean by the Cold War now from the perspective of yeah. your book, from the perspective of all that research uh, we've had in, in recent years. So for a time it looked like an era, 49, 45 to 89. Mm. Then we subdivided it, first Cold War, Deton, mm. second mm. Cold War. Now it looks more like, like a discourse maybe that sometimes was important to some people, but sometimes wasn't important to other people. Or is it just one of many things that were going on in the world post 45? Yeah, it's uh, one of the many things. Maybe not even the most important one for many people. <laughs> yeah, so absolutely. From your perspective. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. What I, do I, we do? I, yeah, yeah. Uh, I completely agree with you. I remember I was presenting this book and to my colleagues at NYU, and then uh, uh, Fred told me, Fred Cooper told, told me, but do you think that the Cold War is the most important thing in that period? I, and uh, of course, I, 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 I knew what he, was, what, what he meant. And I said, no, maybe decolonization is the most important thing. And he was very happy with his answer, of course. <laughs> yeah, the Cold War is just, why is it so important in the historiography? It's because the US has made the historiography. And if you look at the US archives, of course you see the Cold War everywhere. But if you look at other archives, you see other things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and since, you know, the U.S. historians have been so preeminent in writing the history of the Cold War from the perspective with their sources, with the so U.S. sources, I mean, I'm so, I'm so amazed. People, you know, talk to me and say, okay, you have a very distorted view on the Cold War and so on and so forth. Is it more distorted to write the history of this period through the uh, archives of international organizations or to write the history of the same period through one archive, which is the U.S. archives? My God, I mean, I think that it's much more distorted to write the history of the period through the U.S. archives, something which has been done widely and accepted widely. So um, 
It will be my answer. I think that the decolonization is the most important thing, really now, <laughs> after all this, uh, all this work. And also because inequality and so on, and it goes with each other. Uh, so, um, so, um, yeah. so it will be interesting to see how how this develops, how book titles develop in the next in the next years. <laughs> Maybe we'll be able to drop the Cold War. From, <laughs> yeah, and really I write no, about yeah, other yeah. Post forty five at, yeah. at some point. No, you're right. You're right, Martina. <laughs> now it's another history of the Cold War. Maybe we'll do other histories uh, at some oh. point, and the Cold War is just one chapter, and then mm. all the all the other things that that are happening. And how Mm. just as you, you have shown in your book. Yeah. Thank you again mm. for being here and to you for your comments and questions yeah. and to you as well for being here, listening to us and asking questions. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. And thank you for both of you. Really.